Okay, so what I am excited to tell you about is work that I'm really passionate about in our lab to try and understand the evolution of a pretty fascinating phenotype, a, a way of interacting with the environment and assuring camouflage through complicated landscapes through space and time. Um, and it's, it's a, a particularly interesting topic because it's also one that grew out of a decade plus of collaboration with, with researchers here. So everything I'll talk about today actually couldn't exist without the wonderful expertise and colleagues here um, at CBO. So it really is a, a uniquely a great place to give a talk about this research because it, it grew out of expertise here. So we're really interested in my lab and just in general with this question about how do populations adapt to complex and changing environments. And you know, with any obligatory diversity slide, you see all the amazingness of nature that inspired many of us to pursue biology and to do what we do. And it really is a wonderful and, and indulgent line of inquiry. And it's just so captivating. You can think about all the ways that camouflage um, is shaped here to match different complex environments. And we have pattern, we have pigmentation, complicated morphologies, there's mimicry of structures, all kinds of interesting things. Um, but for many of these, they're actually static morphs that um, sort of stay as they are. But what we're gonna talk about today is the particular type of camouflage that tracks changing environments. So as shown here with this snow covered environment. And this is pretty interesting because it sets up all kinds of interesting strategies about how such a character evolves. And I'll be mostly talking about color today, mostly talking about um, coat color camouflage, but we're also using this as a proxy for seasonal um, phenotypes in general. And we're trying to understand more and more about how complex suites of traits actually change to track um, environments through space and time. So we're in, the, we're in the heyday of this type of research and I've already heard so many great examples of the genotype to phenotype connections that have been enabled by these advances in genome technologies. And so this kind of research talk 15 years ago would look fundamentally different. So as we are in this area where in my lab in particular, we spent a lot of time on this genotype to phenotype connection, trying to make these, um, these connections in a convincing way. And this used to be the really hard part, but this is actually the more straightforward part now. And I would argue, and one of the things that I'm so excited about this particular research I'll tell you about today, is I think the ultimate, ultimately one of the most important things about understanding the process of adaptation in different, and in, in, in using it for different applications is this final bit, which is how the phenotype interacts with the environment to determine fitness. And right now, this is actually the area, I think, where we know the least about many of these things. And we have ideas about how camouflage might shape that. But the specifics often remain untested, and we don't have a, a detailed understanding of how you go fully from genome to phenome to fitness. So this is going to be our roadmap for today's talk. And then when we think about fitness, and we think about genotype to phenotype, and the interaction with this environment, you can think about the the really interesting environmental heterogeneity just shown in this picture, right? As you have elevational transects, you have different habitat types, a really, a really complicated um, mosaic landscape that an organism may adapt to. And if it's a broadly distributed organism, it has to deal with many different um, scenarios. And then as we go move through time, we have seasonality. And for, uh, Maybe, maybe a little bit less of an acute thing in Portugal for seasonality, but where I'm from in Montana, seasonality is the predominant challenge that most organisms have to deal with, right? So I was talking to my wife um, yesterday and she was shoveling snow while I was on the beach. Yes, anyway, <laughs> I know many people have told me how cold it is here right now, but it is not that cold. <laughs> and then of course, over deeper time scales, this itself can fundamentally change. And this is just a, a, a polar view of the last glacial maxima with um, the ice sheet showing in black. And so we think about the adaptations we see today, they're a complex realization of all of these processes and then how the genome, the genome determines phenotypes and how they all pull together. So for seasonality, this is, this, this is the issue for these northern climates. So this image is uh, called the breathing 
breathing earth and you can see the green up and brown down of seasonality in many places you know as we can see sort of here you get, you get fluctuations in sort of the amount of vegetation but the predominant thing that you see here in the nor northern hemisphere in particular is the onset of seasonal snow and seasonal snow creates this fundamental challenge that alters how organisms um, navigate these landscapes, right? And there's sort of three major um, solutions to this. I used to say it in a much more complicated way. And then my, my, my oldest child, when she was very young, came home from school and she said, migrate, hibernate, tolerate. And I was like, that is amazing. That is exactly what that is. Now it's in my lectures. So, you know, you can deal with seasonality in this onset. So what, what do you have to deal with? You have to deal with temperature, loss of resources, changes in predation, predation potential, all kinds of interesting things, physiological, morphological, and so on and so forth. And so many organisms just migrate, they leave, right? And this is a fundamentally um, a seasonally changing phenotype that must be closely aligned with both the onset of the change in season here, but wherever they're migrating, the availability of resources there, right? Hibernation, you can just sleep it out in various ways. So there's deep hibernators, there's shallow hibernators. That's a unique set of solutions to avoid it. Neither of these have to deal with the problem, the fundamental problem in place of dealing with this landscape change. What we're mostly interested in are these phenotypes of toleration. So physiological and morphological and behavioral phenotypes that buffer this environment and allow them to deal with changes in temperature and predation and so forth. And to do, all of these are examples, in particular the toleration examples, are examples of uh, a particular type of phenotypic plasticity, which we call in long-lived organisms phenotypic flexibility. Okay? So you can think about phenotyp, a, a phenotype A, B, from A to B, so it could be coat color differences or whatever. As you transition through time, one organ, within one organism's lifetime, not generational, going from one phenotype and then reversing to the other, and the ability to do that. And in these seasonal phenotypes in the Northern Hemisphere, this you could think of this as the transitions between summer and winter phenotypes. Now, these types of traits, it turns out, have evolved over and over again. And one of the most visually compelling and the one I'm gonna focus on the most today is that there's this recurrent pattern of at least 21 species that show seasonal flexibility and camouflage, whereby they exist in a cryptic, usually brownish, um, pelage coloration in the summer. And then with the onset of seasonal snow, they transition to these, um, these cryptic white pelages, right? And this, like many seasonal phenotypes in animals and in plants as well, are cued by photo period. And so you have this trait that is induced by changes in light. And this sets up a really interesting thing. And so in one way, this is a really elegant solution for how you deal with seasonality because photoperiod is over the long run, a reliable signal in, in changes in the season, right? We all realize how, how much shorter the days are getting, right? However, it turns out that photoperiod itself may sometimes become disconnected from the actual thing that the organisms are dealing with, which is change in the abiotic environment, snow cover and related um, characteristics in particular, in the context of climate change, photoperiod is becoming an increasingly unreliable predictor of snow cover. Okay, so this is a, one particular example of this, and there's been many. This one's a little bit out of date, but it's a nice, nice plot of it. And this trend has held. So this is just a, a, a plot of the uh, duration of full uh, the snow season in weeks across years. And you get a lot of variation year to year. We're in a big year in... in um, Northwestern US already is sort of early onset with lots of snow already. So there's a lot of variation, but there is a very strong trend towards reduced snow cover. Indeed, changes in seasonal snow cover are, are the predominant cue of climate change in these um, northern uh, boreal and temperate environments. So it's not just that temperature is, is increasing or that precipitation is, in, is changing, but that, that there's more rain on snow events and snow is becoming more ephemeral, okay? So this is happening over rapid time scales, but we have this trait that is cued by this much more stable um, environmental cue that is, is fixed. And so we wanna understand how these traits evolve to, to understand how 
something like this that is dealing already with a very complex changing um, challenge may evolve in response to the climate change. So for these particular sets of traits, we're interested in both the basic and the fundamental to understand how you evolve a, a seasonally flexible phenotype. But also we wanna be able to use the information that we have to understand over short time scales how such traits may respond to climate change. And we think that under, making these connections could be a really important and fundamental step in, in, in sort of using everything we learn about evolutionary genetics to promote and assure um, conservation of populations in the face of climate change. Okay, so this issue of traits being tracking photo period and photo period becoming an unreliable predictor of seasonal, seasonal snow cover sets up this obvious scenario where snow is going away and you have this potential between mismatch of seasonal traits in the environment. It's quite stark in the, con in the literally stark in the context of camouflage. You get a, a striking mismatch between the environment. But of course, this would extend to other phenotypes as well, such as migration, another one that's classically um, thought to be vulnerable to uh, seasonal changes as, for example, migrating birds migrate and arrive on, um, on, on, their, on their winter grounds, sort of mismatched with the availability of food or returning to spring grounds and mismatching um, food availability. Okay, so we're gonna look at, look at this in general and in my lab, we also work on the Siberian hamsters and then Def and others are, are working on stoats and other mustelids, but we're gonna focus today on, on hares. Okay, so six of the 32 hair species um, of this genus Lepus so, show seasonal camouflage. We're not quite sure yet how many independent origins that is, but it, it's probably maybe a couple at least, um, but at least across six different species, we have these seasonal traits and they tend to be the Northern, the northern species that, that show these phenotypes, okay? And so we're gonna focus on work in snowshoe hares and white-tailed jackrabbits. Um, and for the sake of this. Okay, key collaborators. This is, uh, like I said, not something that we've done alone and it's fundamentally dependent on both Zef and, and Paulo Sello and some other really critical collaborators. And so on, as you think of all of this, um, think about th this is a series of experiments that has relied on deep system expertise and a lot of people de devoting their individual um, expertise and contributions and a lot of work in the field as well. And um, I'll talk a bit all, in particular on, about Scott Mills's population ecology research that really sets the framing for a lot of this. In addition, the real, the real stars here are the students who led all the work. And this particular, I'll touch on aspects of research from all of these amazing students and postdocs that have led this, but in particular, I'm gonna emphasize first Matt Jones's PhD dissertation work and then Mafalda Ferrer's. PhD work. Okay, so here's our roadmap. I started with this general idea of thinking about the connection between genotype to phenotype to fitness. And I argued that in general, this connection is the unknown that we usually have to deal with. And increasingly, this part's easy. So in the snowshoe hair system, the real power here is we're going to start here. I'm going to demonstrate first with this connection why it's important, the trait we're studying how important it is in natural populations, and then we're gonna dive into the genotype to phenotype component. So we're gonna ask some simple questions about this trait. Is snow cover actually a primary driver of seasonal camouflage? It's, it's a super obvious assumption that it is, but it actually hasn't been broadly tested prior to initiation of the, this research that we're looking at. But then we're gonna to turn to what extent phenotypic plasticity may buffer mismatch. Are there ways that the trait may be altered by the environment, either through behavior or the expression of that trait in a way that, that buffers this mismatch potential. And ultimately, in the absence of buffering or the, in, in, the, in the presence of mismatch, what are the fitness consequences of that? Okay, so the first answer to that you know, overarching question that seems quite obvious is that snow cover is indeed the primary driver of seasonal camouflage. So hopefully it comes across okay and you can see the distinction. But this is the distribution of snowshoe hares. And on this map, there's actually a ton of data that this is actually a probabilistic model that is showing the probability of manifesting a winter white versus a winter brown coat and then coloring those probabilities according to the coat, coat colors. 
So what you see overall across this range is the probability of observing a white coat depends on snow cover duration and some um, climatic indices that are related to snow cover, including seasonality and transience of snow. Okay, so bioclim two and three. Now in this under, underlying probabilistic model, which we use from hundreds of museum specimens to look at their seasonal coat colors and geo referenced across the range, we build these probabilistic models that I'll use throughout the talk to emphasize some key points. Okay, so this basically is tracking snow cover. And you see this interesting pattern where you get actually some populations where there's a very, there, there's essentially no expression of a white winter coat and instead they stay brown. Okay, so we'll turn to that last bit in a little bit, but first, next, what are the fitness consequences of mismatch? Okay, so this is really research that has been through multiple decades now of work by Scott Mills and all the people in his lab that, um, and including some people from my lab that have um, aided in these uh, efforts, but really led by Scott and his crew. And so through, through decades now of going out and actually tracking these animals in nature, we know a lot about when and how mismatch manifests and its consequences. Okay, so condensing down a bunch of data, here we're showing weekly photographs of over 220 individually radio collared hairs through time, okay? And then for each, I'll show you a couple of things. This top plot is whiteness of coat. So this is some general metric of whiteness of coat. Each individual line is an individually tracked hair, okay? And then what you can see is that there's this sort of predictable transition. There's a population reaction norm transitioning in this particular site in mid-October as you begin to enter the molt and individuals molt but, um, and turn into a white winter coat and then everybody's white throughout the winter, then there's a spring transition. And on this plot, you can see examples of natural selection, for example, this individual um, stayed white too long, presumably was mismatched, was certainly eaten and exited the experiment. And then here you can see the same kind of data but in the in the cons uh, shown as contrast, so this is this is adding the environmental component. So as you look at these individuals, what you see is it's these shoulder seasons, the fall and the spring, where the camouflage is most often mismatched from the environment. And it turns out that these these are the particularly vulnerable parts of of a snowshoe hare's life. These are the areas where mortality is the highest. Actually, it's lower in the winter and summer outside of juvenile mortality. Okay, so we have these periods of intense, acute, potentially selection against mismatch because of this of transitioning in these, um, in these environments and, and the potential that maybe snow is there or it isn't there to, and you might mismatch. Okay, the other bit that I'll just sort of tell you and, and not go through all of the data, but so far, it seems there's limited plasticity in the onset of fall molts. So big, year, big snow years, low snow years, it doesn't matter. They seem pretty hardwired to photo period. Molt comes, you can pretty much predict within a couple of days, or certainly within five days, when you'll begin to see molting hairs within populations in, in, in Montana, for example, where they do this, okay? And there's actually limited behavioral plasticity, as far as we can tell, to buffer this. So this is an example of a mismatched hair and if you if you walked around the northern the boreal forests um, in areas and you've spent a lot of time out, you've almost certainly seen a mismatched hair. You've been out this time of year. You have to be out at a particular time of year. But when you see this, they they well they stand out for one. Even even if you're you know our eyes aren't particularly acute, but we can see this contrast pretty closely. And in these experiments to show the lack of buffering, essentially it, what you do is you approach the hair and you measure how long, how close you can get before it flees, okay? And it turns out you can get really, really close. So snowshoe hares, their lot in life is to be eaten. Over 85% of their mortality is through predation, which is very high. So they're like the cheeseburger of the forest. Um, and they essentially, they, it's not a matter of if, but when they're going to be eaten, but they rely heavily on crypsis, heavily on camouflage. And so they will stay absolutely still until the very last minute and then they run, right? And they run very fast, but, and they could get away from me, of course, but if you're a lynx or um, a bobcat or something, 
it's um, a much higher uh, predation potential. So they don't seem to run more quickly when they're mismatched. They don't seem to positively associate with snow, for example, if they're winter white. So there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of plasticity in, um, in modifying this potential. So we, we have a phenotype. It's cued by photoperiod. It's cued by the environment. It's closely tied to survival. We demonstrate the mismatch potential, and it doesn't seem to be strongly buffered. There's probably some elements of plasticity that we're missing, but it's not predominant. And ultimately, there's a huge cost of this. So there's a, up to a 7% decline in weekly survival when mismatched, which is a very strong selective coefficient. Now, it's sort of narrow through space uh, or through time. So there's only this sort of period of maximal mismatch that happens for a couple weeks each year. But at that time, individu individuals that are mismatched get eaten a lot faster, right? And so this is what you usually find in the, in, in sort of the, in a case of predation, sort of the Carcass is gone, nothing ever eats the feet, and there's probably a collar laying right here somewhere. So very high consequence to the mismatch. Okay, so this trait is closely tied to survival. In this system in particular, relies on camouflage fundamentally for survival, and we think is under really should be under really strong selection and is predicted to become very um, compromised with climate change and loss of snow potentially. So next, we're going to dive into what the genetic basis of this trait is of locally adapted camouflage and something about how it evolved. So there's two components of color variation that we're going to um, discuss, but I'm going to focus primarily on one. So there's the, the wind to change color. That's the phenology. That's the timing of the molt, which varies across the range and probably has a huge component of local adaptation. We're working on it, but we don't know a lot about it yet. And then there's the if to change color, and this is the polymorphism. This is the winter brown versus winter white coat color. And for this, we're going to ask questions about the genetic basis, the molecular basis, the evolutionary origin, and the spread. And this is research that Matt Jones did for his PhD. He did so well that we gave him a trophy when he finished. You can see he looks that's as ecstatic as Matt actually ever looks. It's a very happy day for him. Okay, so first is this genetic. So there's a simple binary trait. So this is in our captive facility. This is essentially a common garden. I think these individuals were closely related, collected from the same site in Washington. One molts into a winter white coat, a winter brown. There's no intermediates that we can see. It's a strongly binary trait. So a very tractable trait to think about the genetic um, component. Okay, so the first thing that we did is we relied on this natural variation of polymorphism. So in the Pacific Northwest, we have this transition from winter brown to winter white. This corresponds to an environmental gradient as so in this area, precipitation mostly flows in this direction from the coast in. It's much colder inland. But there's a lot more rain here. But as you go up and over these mountains, you get sort of um, increased precipitation and you get more uh, of the rain falling as snow. So winter brown mostly populations out here, and then a huge zone of polymorphism. And so what we did is we did an initial experiment where we did targeted exome capture. So not to get bogged down in the details for this particular bit, we just used an approach where we sequence all the protein coding regions of the genome. Um, and so we're only sequencing about 2% of the genome overall, but it was 80 whole exomes. So 80 individuals where we sequence all the genes, about 200,000 intervals and so on and so forth. Okay. So we have fully winter white, fully winter brown, and polymorphic individuals. When we use the polymorphic individuals and we do a simple association test, so this is what's known as a Manhattan plot. I've seen like many of these since I've been here. So I know many of you are probably familiar, but just in case you aren't, each one of these points is a single nucleotide polymorphism, whereby we test the hypothesis whether or not that genetic variant is significantly associated with the trait. Here the trait is a simple binary white versus brown, in this Manhattan plot, you get a single skyscraper, a single highly significant. So this is on a log scale, and this is a very conservative bottom for any correction, but still we get this significant peak here um, where there's a strong association. Underneath that peak, um, this is now expanding complete uh, low coverage whole genome sequencing. So it's more continuous. This was exome data. We see a very now very familiar gene, the agouti locus, which has been shown again and again and again and again 
to be involved in coat color variation. And for some reason, I think I might have even bet you that it wasn't going to be a goody when we went in. I do not have good intuition on things like this, but this clearly is at the bottom of this peak. This is FST between phenotypes. So there is no genetic differentiation otherwise in these populations between phenotypes, just one large um, interbreeding population. But you see this strong peak right here. We also learned that winter brown is fully receptive to winter white. Okay, so just a little bit on, on the molecular underpinnings of this. So agouti, as many of you know, is this antagonist interacts with the melanocortin-1 receptor and influences the outcomes of melanogenesis and melanocytes, shifting um, ex um, the production of pigments towards pheomelanin or with very high expression sort of shutting down pigment production altogether. Okay, so you tend to see dark um, or light uh, associated phenotypes with one of these two loci. And the prediction based on what, everything we know about the way this process works is that the induction of a winter white coat would be associated with the seasonal upregulation of agouti. That would be your sort of a priori hypothesis. So we asked that question and we did so using individuals from our captive facility. And so this is actually work that um, the, the, the sampling framework was actually outlined as part of Mafalda's your master part of your master's work, right? So we actually showed this the feasibility. And the nice thing about a seasonal molter is it's a developmental time point that you can simultaneously sample different time points of that process at the same time because it's a mosaic molt that proceeds in waves across the body. Okay, so this is an example of a molting hair. It's not demonic or anything, it's just the red eye glow, but the so this particular individuals we can we can look at sort of molting, leading edge molting hair. So either depending on which way it's going, either recently molted or not quite molted yet, and we can get a, an individual developmental timeline and we can ask questions about gene expression. And it turns out in this particular experiment, we are very lucky um, in that we were bringing in hairs for other purposes in our captive facility. And um, despite our statements in our animal care and use uh, uh, work that we would absolutely never bring in pregnant females because we could clearly avoid that, we sometimes made mistakes and this particular female came in and she was pregnant and, and it turned out she gave birth in the facility. So just, there's no problem with that mistake. It's just, we tried to avoid it and nonetheless got it. It was very fortuitous. It turns out she was a heterozygote. She was fully winter white and she had mated with an unknown genotype, but that was a carrier of the winter brown. And we were able to verify the transmission of this um, fully dominant uh, at a goody locus brown versus white in a, in a simple pedigree. But importantly, we're also able to use these heterozygotes to test um, patterns of gene expression um, at, at this locus. And when we do this, we can actually ask if the winter white versus winter brown allele is upregulated when molting into a white coat. And we see massive upregulation of the, uh, the white allele in this transition. And this is the classic signature of a cis-regulatory vari variant. So the winter white, um, haplotype has evolved a cis-regulatory variation that drives the seasonal expression, upregulates it, results in the white winter coat in a fully dominant fashion. Okay, so then we can turn to the origin of this trait now that we know the genetic basis. And the first thing we see when we compare two genomes, a winter white versus a winter brown, is that there's extensive divergence at this locus. So this is a plot of DXYs, this um, uh, pairwise genetic divergence between these two types. And if you sit in, shown in gray is the genome-wide distribution, 99.9% .9 quantile. And we had this massive peak about four times um, above mean right at this uh, locus. So this tells us, deep divergence tells us that this is not a recent de novo mutation. We can then look at this in relation to phylogenetic relationships. So we sequenced whole genomes um, uh, uh, across the range of snowshoe hare populations. So most of them are winter white and these coastal winter browns, which appears to be very recently derived. And then um, a, a representative seasonal changer, the mountain hare from, from Europe, and then this black-tailed jackrabbit rooted with the outgroup um, of the rabbit. And when we compare this species tree, this is sort of what we expect and what we found for relationships. And then we compare this to the agouti tree, we see something very different. That is the winter brown versus winter white groups, we get clustering not by evolutionary relationship of the populations and species, but of the phenotypes. So is this um, ancient variation or hybridization? 
We can then test that through a, like comparing divergence overall within the brown and white groups and doing a bunch of simulations and doing a deep dive into this. And the sort of quick answer to that is that this is fully explained by hybridization, whereby the winter brown allele was acquired through hybridization with um, the jackrabbit, a black-tailed jackrabbit. So this is quite shocking um, and quite interesting. And so what, this, what we found then overall is that the snowshoe hares, um, which overall tended to molt into white winter coats, acquired these brown coats through hybridization with this ecologically very different prairie scrub species. And they're not known to hybridize in nature, but they clearly hybridize at some low level. So hybrids haven't been detected in nature, or uh, at least they haven't been identified. But nonetheless, this variation was introduced and seeded local adaptation to this environment. We estimate that it was about 9,000 years ago or so, so fairly recent within the whole sort of evolutionary history of this group. So winter coats are a recently derived thing, but still a bit ancient, it's not, it's not yesterday. Um, when we compare the timing of the hybridization, we also can look and see strong evidence of a selective sweep at the same locus, at the agouti locus for the winter brown um, haplotype. And we estimate, you know, that there's some error and some challenges in doing these dating estimates, but we get a much younger sweep time. And so it seems that there was a hybridization event and, and it wasn't instantly swept and fixed locally. So there's what we call a long sojourn um, time. And we've done a bunch of inquiry into this and basically shown that this sort of real long leg of thousands of generations can simply be explained by the fact that brown is recessive. So overall brown is recessive, it's not immediately exposed to selection. Other more complicated things could be going on here, but you need not invoke that to explain this pattern. So pulling it all together, we've done a bunch of work to try and look at sort of the timing and the sweep timing, and then also the pa pattern of population genetic structure and the ability for this allele to spread, predicting that winter brown coats may be benef increasingly beneficial as we go into the future and loss of snow. And for this particular scenario, this elegant solution of hybridization of introducing this pre-made um, genetic variation that was locally adapted to stay brown in the winter by hybridizing with a, a non-seasonally changing additional species actually isn't a very elegant solution overall because it doesn't look like this allele is going to play a very important role more broadly across the range because it's limited by dominance and population structure and geography. Now we're getting winter brown coats popping up occasionally on the margins here. And we've just looked at this a hint so far. And so far those appear to have a different genetic basis. We don't know what it is, but we know it isn't this um, introgressed allele. So overall, we see seasonal camouflage has evolved to track seasonal snow. Um, environmental mismatch has severe consequences on survival and it's not strongly buffered by plasticity. Winter brown coats have recently evolved and were acquired by hybridization with another species. And this locally adapted variation in the Pacific Northwest is um, unlikely to contribute to range-wide adaptations. So we figured out one component of the system we actually don't think it's a cri very critical component to understanding long-term sort of evolutionary trends outside of the Pacific Northwest, where it certainly will play a role. The match has already begun, hasn't it? Any updates on this? <laughs> One nil? Oh, let's relax. Okay. So I'm going a little bit slow, but I, I will... Um, shift gears in the spirit of making sure we see the additional goals. I'm sure Ronaldo's got a couple more, right? So we're gonna turn to this white-tailed jackrabbit system. And for this, we're gonna try and do the same thing that we did in the snowshoe hares, understand the genetic basis of seasonal variation in this species, but more explicitly link it to the potential for evolutionary change into the future and its potential for conservation. So this is work that Mafalda beautifully led, and I would have been here a, a year ago or so for her defense and party if uh, not for the damn virus, but um, now we'll celebrate. Um, so Mafalda led this work as a chapter of her dissertation and with, also with uh, really nice contributions from a postdoc in my lab, uh, Tim Thurman, a former postdoc now. And so this is the same sort of phenotypic distribution for white-tailed jackrabbits, and there's a couple key differences. <clears throat> 
first off, you can see it, there's a lot more brown versus white. It's a lot more mosaic. It's a lot less of a sort of dominated by one phenotype and local adaptation of the other. Okay, and so this is the same sort of projection based on um, individual sort of museum specimens, getting the species distribution model and the phenotypic projections, okay? And so we're gonna talk about genetic work that Mafalda and Tim led in here, where there was dense sampling across the steep environmental gradient in Colorado in, in the um, Rocky Mountains, along the Rocky Mountain front. The other thing that's interesting about white-tailed jackrabbits is it's not a simple binary trait. So unlike snowshoe hares, so this isn't a molt series, this is actually individual hares at their peak winter coat color. And you can see a range from mostly brown to um, fully white with the exception of the ears and sort of everything in between. And this was noted by early naturalists, um, Hansen and Bear, that noticed by, by studying um, populations of, of jackrabbits within Colorado, that there was likely this polytypic winter coats that suggests a dominance of two or more or pairs of genes. So they had already sort of indicated that it was likely multigenic here, so a more complicated trait to deal with. So this is where uh, Mafalda and I and some very uh, some great uh, uh, field assistants went out into a very cold winter that year and went to this area and it explored. We actually went to the same area, the Cocotopa area in Colorado, which, sorry, I should have pointed this out. It was right in here um, and tried to revisit their steps and collect additional samples. And in this area, you can see the environmental heterogeneity that could lead to coat color variation. So this was a low snow year, although it was very cold. And this is the Cocotopa Dome here. And, um, and here is Mafalda about probably 40 kilometers away from there on a, the same day or a similar day with no snow cover. And here there's snow cover. You can see it's a much more open habitat, jackrabbit tracks running through the snow. <laughs> Here's that Cocotopa Dome area again. So this is sort of the center of the polymorphic zone as you transition to snow-free to increasingly snowy environment. Here's the snow-free environment, not very far away. So these are both areas where we collected um, jackrabbits. Okay, so if we do the same scenario where we sequence individual low coverage genomes of different jackrabbits and, and test for an association with coat color, here it's not binary. So there's an association with PC1 of, um, of spec data on, on coat color variation. We've looked at several different aspects of this, but PC1 really sort of captures a lot of what we are looking at here. We do the same kind of association and we see two peaks rather than one. Um, and underneath these peaks actually are different genes than Agouti and MC1R. So we actually found the first sort of largest peak here is the EDNRB locus. You can see it's quite a tight association, sort of falls right on this gene and there's not other genes sort of right, right by, so it's entirely contained within that. And then we see an added, this is the phenotypic, this PC1 um, of, of the trait. And you can see it's sort of an additive pattern of inheritance where the heterozygote is intermediate between the homozygote. EDNRB is um, signaling promotes proliferation and differentiation of melanocytes. Uh, melanocyte stem cells and enhancing the regeneration of hair and epidermal cells and epidermal melanocytes. So the classic piebald phenotype is a mutation of the EDNRB locus. And it's interesting because um, as far as I know, outside of, I, I think, pigeons, where the, a duplicate of this gene has been associated with pigmentation variation, this hadn't previously been associated with natural uh, variation within a mammal. So it's a surprising and exciting finding. The next one is this locus corn. And so the same kind of scenario and association, actually this one's entirely contained within the gene and we see a fully additive type pattern again. And this um, is a serine protease that's a novel modifier of agouti. So it interacts with agouti and so it's great within the agouti pathway. So it also makes sense. Mutations in corn are associated with some of the, the white or light phenotypes that you see in tigers. Okay, so we have these two strong associations. It's novel variation. It wasn't the same pattern that we saw in snowshoe hares. And together shows this sort of pattern of additive variation. Actually, agouti does play a role in this system. We think it might be epistatic. It doesn't show up when you look at PC1 as a continuous pattern. But if you treat it as a binary trait and you ignore some of that variation, agouti pops up. 
as does a fourth locus that doesn't have any association with pigmentation that we know of. Um, and we think it actually might be a correlated environmental trait. So there's a little more going on depending on how you test this, but, but a goody does play a role. Okay. And then if you begin to combine these in different ways, you get the sort of fully additive effects where you get sort of brown, brown, homozygous brown alleles of both your most brown and likewise of, of white. So rel more complicated than snowshoe hairs, but not, not terribly complicated. And then here's a macro sort of image of what a full heterozygote looks like. You can see this much more frosted look versus homozygote white and homozygote brown at both loci. Okay, so if we repeat the same exercise of divergence across the genome and ask something about the evolutionary history. Here we've sequenced many more genomes across this, um, the lepus radiation. We see a very striking pattern, just like we did in snowshoe hares, and that there's peaks of divergence at each of these. Again, tells us it's not a recent de novo mutation. It's probably old. Where did it come from? Is this gene flow or is it something else? And if we look at the individual genealogies for each of these loci, and remove some of the messiness of other species, we see that there's actually a very deep split consistent with the divergence across all of these. And we see the same pattern over and over again where black-tailed jackrabbits are sister to white-tailed jackrabbits that show the brown um, alleles at all, at all, four of the, or all three of these loci. And then the white allele is sort of more closely related to other um, seasonally changing, closely related, sort of basically reflecting the, the species relationships here. Okay. Okay, so the, this sort of pattern showing up, much like snowshoe hare being closely related to black-tailed jackrabbit, same with white-tailed jackrabbit. So for each of these, we test this hypothesis of is this gene flow, um, or actually, is it ancestral polymorphism? These genealogies could be, um, you could manifest this simply by having really ancient variation that's um, incompletely sorted across these species, or it could be recent gene exchange. And when we test this every possible way, I should say that's the royal we here. When Mafalda tested this every possible way and really dove into it, we found a very strong signature of hybridization at Agouti. Again, it seems to be a hot spot for adaptive integration. Something about its, its position in the pathway and perhaps it's not highly pleiotropic in this system, but it sort of seeds this um, light, browner phenotypes. Again, again, there's a, 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 a third example of this as well. In another system that Zeph's shown. And then there's the other two, actually, we can't rule out that this is very ancient variation that's maintained by long-term balancing selection. Turns out the divergence between these alleles is such that it goes quite deep. So there's also hybridization between these species. So it's sort of, we're not entirely sure, but we know overall there's a mixture of hybridization, clearly long-term balancing selection, underlying this multigenic adaptation to snow cover. This tells us that this type of variation, uh, unlike the snowshoe hair, oh, in the snowshoe hair, we know a lot about how it connects to fitness. We don't know in this system. And this experiments are harder in, in the jackrabbits versus the snowshoe hares to, to track them across the landscape. But this evolutionary pattern tells us likely that this has been incredibly important to the fitness of this species for a long time and likely maintained by spatially varying selection of snow cover. So using this information, we wanted to challenge ourselves to think about how this trait may evolve across this complicated landscape as snow cover changes. So here's our prediction of phenotype in the recent past. We want to use this genotype, the phenotype map, to understand the potential for evolutionary response to rapidly changing environment. If we take a high emission scenario, which was what we have available for snow cover, and we take the same correlation between environment and the phenotypes that we use to construct this model, and we predict what the phenotypes would be um, in 2080, we see a transition to a mostly brown phenotype across the South, a pretty dramatic shift. This is much more, much stronger than what you see in snowshoe hares. So this predicts that there's gonna be a rapid shift towards winter brown coats across much of the Southern portion of the range. Now, if you highlight the, the, um, the degree of prop change in probability of coat color, you can, you can isolate these individual areas where evolutionary change is predicted to be the most acute, the most intense, okay? So this is a shift in the probability from high probability of winter brown, um, of winter, a low probability of winter 
um, brown across much of the range, shifting towards a high probability in the future. Okay. So this is our map, and we can begin to ask, okay, well, can they adapt in general? And how will this look sort of as you get this increased intensity of mismatch? So to begin to explore this, we've used what we know about the trade architecture and something about the population ecology to begin to simulate these worst case scenarios of evolutionary response, uh, um, sort of making some assumptions about what the fitness consequences will be. And when we do this in the jackrabbits, it, it's actually a fairly hopeful story. So this is with this additive variation, we, we predict that there will be an initial decline with environmental challenge. There's a fitness cost here for sure, but the additive genetic architecture should actually be quite nimble in evolutionary response. And there'll be an initial decline, but we predict evolutionary rescue relatively quickly. This line is showing in the absence of adaptive variation. So if you were only harboring winter brown variation and selecting for winter, um, sorry, winter white variation and selecting for, for winter brown coats, that would just predict this decline. So overall, there's a lot of potential for mismatch. We actually think that the, the standing variation that exists it's not a dire story, which is nice when conservation, at least as we understand it, this is, suggests a, a real strong potential for um, robust evolutionary rescue and also a way to think about prioritizing populations that might seed that adaptation and the populations where you would want to monitor the most where there's potential for um, acute mismatch and to sort of promote adaptive evolution. Okay, so that's if it's all in a vacuum. now. They have experienced pretty intense other pressures in the past. Okay, so white, it turns out white-tailed jackrabbits are much more conservation um, restricted. This is a very sick picture, I know, but this this gives you an example of historical predation. So this is the artistic nature of the Western U.S. in the 1923. So this is in Brush, Colorado, where they would do these jackrabbit drives and they would kill every jackrabbit that they could get within a weekend or something. And then they would sometimes spell things. So all of these are individual jackrabbits. And this has actually led to a pretty strong population decline across much of the southern part of the range. And it turns out it's, it's unfortunately, it overlaps disproportionately with harbor, the populations that should harbor winter brown variation. So we predict robust evolutionary rescue, but there's actually reason to be concerned that the populations most um, with the highest potential of adaptation might actually be the most vulnerable to other um, anthropogenic stressors, okay? And a recent review sort of underscored this, not knowing about the camouflage genetic basis, but just sort of ongoing decline of white-tailed jackrabbit. They're considered a least concerned species, but they've clearly had a lot of conservation threats, including habitat alteration, climate change, depredation, previous slide, and changes in predators, okay? So these populations that are best adapted to respond to these in some cases might already be extirpated. And so we think that using this trait-driven framework to think about how we might promote evolutionary rescue can be used to prioritize the overall sort of which populations are they stable and, and, and will they facilitate evolutionary rescue. So we're hoping this overall framework is a way where we can begin to think about using evolutionary genetics and, and think about it in a very precise and also management-friendly way to think about how we might promote at, um, conservation through an adaptive lens going into the future. And I'll just sort of end by saying um, a large group of us as led by Scott Mills have, have evaluated this across many different species and shown that polymorphism is widespread across many different species. And so this is the same kind of thing, but rather than brown versus white, it's cold versus warm colors. Polymorphism exists again and again across these different areas, we think that these will be evolutionary hotspots for re adaptive responses to climate change. But the, our work has shown that the specifics of how evolution will proceed in each of these will likely depend on the dominance of that trait, the genetic details under all. And we actually don't know this for many of these, although you guys are making a lot of progress on, on the weasels and, and stoats. Okay, so just overall thinking about coat color and as a way to think about phenotypic plasticity and how such complicated traits may adapt to future environments. Here I've shown you examples of one form of toleration, seasonal camouflage. We think that overall beginning to understand and dissect these diverse suites of traits will be pretty important 
for understanding how biodiversity will respond and evolve in response to the, the critical um, challenges of climate change given seasonal environments. All right, that's it.